we want to continue worshiping this morning. We're going to do that through the reading of God's Word. And so if you have your Bible, I would strongly encourage you to turn to the book of Acts, where we have been spending our time together looking at this character in the New Testament, a man named Barnabas, who was a follower of Jesus. And as he followed Jesus, and we learn from his life, Barnabas was really just following Jesus. If we are following and learning from Barnabas' life, we too are following Jesus. And as we've seen and heard this morning and will from our text today, it really is all about growing closer to Jesus. And so we want to mine the truth of God's word, what we can find from Barnabas' life to do that. Uh, I will say this as we begin our time in Scripture. When I turned 16 for Christmas, um, my family gave me in 1994 a 1982 Ford Mustang. In 1994, they gave me a 1982 Ford Mustang that went zero to 60 in five miles. It was phenomenal, but it was the coolest car that I could have ever received. And my dad sat me down at the, at the kitchen table and he said, you probably think you put gas in it and it goes, but there's more to it than that. And he said, the first thing I want to tell you is you have the potential with a several ton vehicle to harm yourself or someone else if you're not paying attention. And that was before cell phones. He laid out a few things that he wanted me to be mindful of. And one of the things he told me is he said, there's going to be times where unexpected emergencies happen. And he handed me one of these. I don't know how many of you drive with a roadside emergency service kit in the back of your car. But he handed me one of those. This isn't the kit, but it's a kit. And I can remember thinking as a kid, man, just give me the keys. Like, let me go. And you think your parents are not as mature as you are when you're a kid. But as you get older, you realize they're a whole lot smarter than I thought. Maybe I was the one with the issues. And dad said, there will come a time when you'll have an emergency and you won't have an opportunity to get ready. You'll need to be ready. There will come a time where you will need to be ready for whatever is happening. You won't have time to get ready. And so whether you open your trunk this week and you see one of these back there, or whether it's in your garage and should be in your car and you see it there this week, I want you to be mindful of that truth. Oftentimes when God is at work, we will not have time to get ready. We will need to be ready. And so one of the greatest challenges for us, one of the greatest responsibilities for us as the church at Avenue South is to be prepared, equipped, and ready, sitting on go so that when the Lord invites us to join him in a specific task in our city, or around the globe, we are equipped and ready, and that there will be nothing to hinder us from joining him in that work. I want you to see in these four verses today what the church in Antioch was doing to be prepared and ready and sitting on go so that we too can be ready when the Lord invites us to join him. Would you stand with me in honor of God's word this morning as we read from Acts chapter 13, and we'll read verses 1 through 4 together. And here's what God's word says. Now the church in, in the church in Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaen, a close friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul, who we now know as Paul. Verse 2, as they, the church, were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work for which I have called them. Then after they, that's the church, had fasted, prayed, and laid hands on them, they sent them off into the mission. As the church was gathered worshiping and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me these two leaders for the work for which I have called them. Then after the church had fasted, prayed, and laid hands on these leaders, they then blessed them and sent them off out into the mission. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, the reason we have gathered here together on this Lord's Day, the first day of the week, is to proclaim that there is no God like you. But it's also to profess we desire to partner with you in your mission for our city and our world to bring hope and healing to others in Jesus' name. The church at Antioch was ready and willing to partner with you when you invited them to join you. I pray that the same will be said for the church at Avenue South. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Well, I really this morning want to draw your attention to three things that the church at Antioch was doing to put themselves in a position to be ready to join God in his work. But I want to make a couple of observations about the first century church, the church in Antioch, that I think are applicable for us. Verse 1 tells us that the church had specific leaders for specific roles, but there were specific people in the church that Luke, the writer of Acts, tells us. He tells us there was Barnabas, who was of Jewish descent, but he was also Greek. There was Niger, who was presumably from Africa. He most likely had black colored skin. He was different than someone from the Middle East. There was Lucius, who was from North Africa. North Africa is very different than around Israel and around the Mediterranean on the east side of that sea. Menaean, who was well connected to Herod, someone who had socioeconomic ties and political influence most likely. What this tells us is that the local church from its inception was incredibly diverse. The local church was incredibly diverse ethnically, racially, socioeconomically, culturally. And in many ways, one of the things I love about the church in Antioch, I've shared with you before, but I, I, I probably love the church in Philippi more than any other church in the New Testament. That's just me. But one of the things I love about the church in Antioch was that it was so diverse, and it was a reflection of God's heart and his desire for what the church should look like. God intends for his church to be diverse. God intends for his church to be diverse. Now, one of the things I want you to know as a church, for any church, as I understand it in scripture, is that diversity is not the goal. Diversity is a goal, but it's not the goal. What happens is that when you and I value the dignity and the worth of all people from all backgrounds, then when we hear Jesus say that he has come to bring life to whosoever will respond to him and his truth, as we share that with all people from all racial, ethnic, socioeconomic backgrounds, as we affirm the value and the worth of each person, what God does is he diversifies his church. Because he starts bringing in people from different backgrounds. Now, the reason we're talking about that is because God is diversifying his church even here. But as he gives us opportunities in different neighborhoods and with people from different backgrounds and with people from different countries and socioeconomic context, the Lord is going to diversify his church. And that is something that we should celebrate. It was a hallmark of the church at Antioch. But it starts when you and I do something very basic. When we see that every man, woman, and child on the planet is created in the image of God. Even someone you disagree with is not your enemy. They are created in the image of God and their life has dignity and worth and value. And when you and I live that way, it's not always easy. I'll acknowledge that. We're not always going to agree with everybody. Maybe even in the church we're not always going to agree. But when we live as if we are communicating dignity and worth and respect to others. What God does is he brings people in to find hope in Jesus, and he diversifies his church. I want us to keep that in mind as the Lord leads us into the future mission and strategies that he's given us as a church. But there's something else that's also critical in this passage. One of the things that we see in this passage about Paul and Barnabas being set aside is that God intends for every member of the church to be sent into the mission. God intends for every member of the church to be sent into, to participate in, to contribute to the mission of the church. The Bible tells us in verse 2, as they, if you have a pen with you, underline that, circle that, as they, it's not just Paul and Barnabas, but that's as the church was gathered. They often weren't able to gather even throughout history and throughout the early church, not just here, but in, but in other cities. They weren't even able to gather in buildings that are as large as this one. I know there are larger houses of worship in North America, but for many of them, they, they weren't even able to gather in a large space like this, whether that be for persecution or they couldn't find a, a building that could house the growing church. But when they did gather and when they did come together for worship, they celebrated that God was calling people in the church into specific roles of ministry, into specific roles of service. And one of the things here is that Paul and Barnabas were called to have a specific role in the mission of God. Now, oftentimes in the local church, we, we celebrate through story, 
We celebrate about the life change that God is doing in people's lives. We often celebrate through salvations, how God is bringing people to faith in Jesus Christ. The most critical thing we can celebrate, yes. We celebrate baptisms. People who say, I not only have maybe privately professed my belief in Jesus, me and him, but I publicly want to go on record. It's the greatest demonstration of God's grace, buried to our old life, raised to new life. We celebrate by acknowledging baptism, salvations. Sometimes the church in North America says, our effectiveness of us partnering with Jesus and his mission is how many people attend a worship service. And that is something we want to pay attention to. But as I've shared before, my conviction is you can have one, two, three, four, ten services full of people, and that doesn't necessarily, just hear me, I'm not talking about us, but that doesn't just automatically indicate that we're on mission with God. One of the most important things we can measure and celebrate is how many people are being sent out into the mission. That, that's why I mentioned the team in Athens. That there are a lot of people that it was a huge deal this week right now to use their vacation time to go on a mission trip. Big deal. And, and the staff and I want to be mindful of that. That, that if we go on a mission trip, we, we need to be mindful as a staff, and we're in the ministry of God, that we need to be mindful that many of our members who are not in ministry are going to have to burn their vacation, their precious time that you think about at Christmas and Thanksgiving, the holidays, to go on a mission trip, to do that, to go where God is calling them. But one of the reasons we want to celebrate it is not only the sacrifices and the commitment of our people, but oftentimes you get a front row seat to see something that you don't get to see normally in Nashville or in your normal rhythms. We're just, we're just kind of blinded to it. We want to celebrate the number of people going on short-term mission trips. And the first year we were here, we had a 100% increase. The next year, we had a 135% increase. And we started with Brandon Smith going to Guatemala as our first missionary sent out onto the field. We now have Shannon Edens. This is in Honduras. She's in Honduras right now, dusting for God's fingerprints, whether or not he wants her to stay more than just a few months there. We have five or six men and women in our congregation that are praying about stepping away from America and moving to where God's calling them. We want to celebrate that as much as how many services we have, how many numbers we have numerically in our small groups. All of that's important. But consistently, God sent people out. And sometimes that means sending out globally, outside the walls. And for many of us, we are sent out, and it doesn't look like a mission trip, but you're sent out into the places where you live, where you work, or where you play. Some of you in this room, I mentioned this last week, you are educators, and you will be in a classroom with people where you can shape and mold and invest in their hearts and their minds the goodness of Jesus in a way that I never will be able to. There are a lot of ways you can be sent out into the community the other six days of the week. But God also sends people into his mission within the walls. We talked about the growth of the preschool and children's ministry here, which is a great thing to be addressing. We had 15 kids four years ago. We have approximately 100 on Sundays now. It's a wonderful growth opportunity. A couple in our church heard me mention that and emailed me and said, we want to serve. We want to serve. We want to jump in. We want to contribute. We want to be sent into the mission within the walls. So sometimes people are sent outside the walls. Sometimes people are sent within the walls. But God intends for every member every man or woman who's part of the local church, to contribute. And so I want you to know, if you do not know where that is, we talked about it a lot last week, but I don't want it to be normal here at the Church of the Avenue South for us to just simply attend worship and not be plugged into the mission. I want that to be abnormal so that we are actually, if you're a leader in the church, we're actively looking for people who aren't plugged in and inviting them to join us in what we're doing. So if you're a life group leader, invite somebody to join you in your group. If you are a mentor or a tutor at the elementary school, invite somebody to join you in that work. Whatever it may be, God intends for every member to participate in the mission. And he just highlights Paul and Barnabas to do that. So those are a couple of things we see that are happening in the church at Antioch. But remember what I said. When my dad gave me this, this roadside assistant kit, he said, you're going to need everything in here so that when... An opportunity comes along, you will be ready. And like I said, I thought that was silly. Yeah, 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 just give me the keys. Until that 12-year-old Mustang, as rock solid as Ford made them, had some issues. And when it started, I pressed on the gas, but it started slowing down. Which, like, if, if you're not a mechanic, it's totally fine. But that isn't supposed to happen. 
When you press, it's supposed to go. And when I got on the side of the road, that first time, you ever been there? That first time, you're like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, what do I do, what do I do, what do I do? Oh yeah, I got the roadside assistant kit. And so I got out of the car acting like I had put it there, I knew what I'm doing, hey everybody, I'm gonna put the, and I always, I've always wanted to use the road flares, I have never used the road flares. I even took them out of this kit so that nothing would accidentally go off here in the service, but it is packed with all kind of goods and resources in here. The, the church at Antioch was ready. That, that if, a, if a challenge came along like that, or if God walked up to them and said, I have something I want to invite you into, that they were ready to participate with him in it. And so I, I just simply want to acknowledge what the church in Antioch was doing that I think the church at Avenue South can be doing, just like Barnabas, just like Antioch, to put us in a position, and, and I know we're partnering with God right now. I am not minimizing anything that we're doing or a part of. But there's a couple of things that I want you to see here. Number one, the church in Antioch gathered in worship. The Bible tells us that they were gathered in worship. They were gathered in worship expecting to hear from God, and that's when God spoke to them. Pastor Finette mentioned a moment ago that the Lord spoke to him. The Lord said something, and it was an audible voice for the church in Antioch. I would love to hear an audible voice from God. I said that one time. Somebody said, no, you wouldn't. That would freak you out. But when the Lord puts a gentle conviction on your heart or you feel like the pastor or whatever the scripture is on the screen during the songs, you feel like the Lord's reading your mail. He's, he's stirring in you and you confirm it with scripture. And that's why it's so important for you to be in community with others. That is why it is so important for you to be in community with others so that they can help you discern what God is doing in your life. But they were gathered in worship. And one of the things that I absolutely love is when I look out in this room and I see the generations in this room, when I see teenagers and students in this room sitting with their parents in worship, and they're hearing the same things that we're talking about and celebrating and can talk about it as a family when they go home, on Sunday afternoons, if you have a preschooler or a child in our Grove ministry, you get an email pushed to you each week that says, here's what we talked about this morning, so that you can talk about it in the van on the way to school or around the lunch table or around the, the breakfast or dinner table or at bedtime when you say prayers or things settle down at home. One of the things I love that happens when we're in corporate worship or gathered on a Sunday morning is that God speaks to his people. And that's why the writer of Hebrews said we shouldn't neglect this. So it's so important for us to keep coming together so that we are in tune and best aligned to hear from God. And Emily said this earlier. Sometimes for some of us, that's a posture. It literally is sitting where we are. For some of us, it's kneeling because we feel like when we get down, we can hear from the Lord. But coming together in worship is an opportunity for us to lean into God and I would like to ask you, did you come this morning expecting to hear from him? It's a very convicting but just honest question that I need to answer too. Did you and I come this morning expecting to hear from God? Because he's always speaking. Unfortunately, me, us, we're often too busy and distracted to hear his voice. So we don't need to neglect this moment, and we will never remove the corporate time of prayer where we say together we want to lean in and listen. The church was gathered in worship, but they were also gathered in prayer. Did you notice what it says there? The church was gathered, worshiping, fasting, and the church was praying in verse 3. The church was gathered in prayer, expecting to hear from God. They were expecting to hear from God, and I would just challenge you this week. Spend more time listening for God than you do speaking to him in your prayers. Very simple challenge. You can write this down if you got your journal out. But whatever time you spend in prayer, if it's five minutes, it's five minutes. Some people in this room are prayer warriors, and you spend hours in prayer. I would encourage you to spend as much time listening for what he might say. And for some of us, that, that scares us to death. It drives us crazy because we get bored. We stare at the carpet. We get distracted. And like, I love Jesus. But oh my gosh, I'm looking at the birds out the window. Where was I? Okay, like, I get it. I get it. But just try it. Present your request, but say, Lord, I am here and I am listening. I mean, you could sit there with your palms open and say, I'm in a receptive posture. Speak to me. And maybe as you read this passage this week, which you should read these four verses at least once over the next six days until we come back together. And as you read them, say, Lord, what is it from this passage you're teaching me? And maybe you write down prayer. I, I don't pray enough, Lord. Like, I know that's where the empowerment to do what you've called me to do comes from. But I'm not connected to you in prayer. Lord, help me to be consistent in prayer. Maybe you want to present that to him, but listen. Listen for him. The church was listening so that they might hear what he would lead them to do and be prepared to respond. But the church was also fasting. 
The Bible tells us in verse 2, if you have your pen with you, underline in verse 2, the church was fasting before the Spirit spoke, and after the Spirit spoke in verse 3, they fasted again. They fasted, which means this, you, you forego some sort of physical desire you have or need that you have in order to create more space and more margin in your life to hear from God. Okay, so let me just say that again. Fasting is a spiritual discipline of when you forego, you control your impulse or your desires, you forego of something so that you can backfill and reuse that extra margin that you just created in your life to lean into the things of God. And I have a confession, like this is very seldom practiced among Christians anywhere on the globe, but especially in North America and, and, and Baptists in general, I have not historically been really understanding of what fasting means, but it simply means you forego something. And, and yes, it means food, our most basic need that we might have even tonight, this afternoon, in just a few minutes, some of you, you know that need, stomach's rumbling, you know it's coming, like I'm not encouraging you to fast at lunch. You'd be like, oh, I totally feel guilty if I eat this sandwich. Go ahead and eat it. But here's what I want you to do. I want you to think about this week. Is there something you need to deny yourself of? So that every time you have that craving, it encourages you and reminds you to approach the Lord. Okay? For, for, it, it may be food. For me, I, I already made the decision. Because every time I preach, I have to preach it to myself first and say, am I ever standing on the platform asking our members to do something I'm not willing to do? So one of the things I'm going to be doing is fasting from physical nourishment. And I don't ever want it to be unhealthy or anybody to like not eat all week. Don't do that. But I'm also going to be fasting from social media. Number one, twice over the past 72 hours, my kids tried to talk to me and they saw the back of my phone. Gosh, what a, I, I can't believe that. And I was like, oh my gosh, put this thing down, put this thing down. And you just drift into it, right? So number one, I, I want to unplug from some of that. But secondly, like, I want to backfill the time that I would reach for my phone to connect with people on social to pray and to listen from the Lord. And so that's what I'm going to do. Whatever it is, are you and I creating margin in our life to hear from the Lord? And then they fasted afterwards. They fasted afterwards so that they could hear clearly from the Lord, and so that they could obey faithfully. One of the things that I want our church to be known for is our coming together in worship, that we prioritize prayer, and this is, is, is a new one for many of us, but I want us to fast and to set aside what we feel is important from a human standpoint so that we can prioritize what God would be saying and doing to the extent that we are so hungry to hear from him, it supersedes everything else. That we can hear his voice clearly as he leads us where he wants us to go. And so I'm just going to challenge you to do this this week. I'm going to challenge you when you pray, and I hope that you're praying. When you pray, spend more time listening for God's voice than you do speaking. I'll do the same. I want to encourage you to fast or abstain from something this week, not to an unhealthy extent, but instead of that thing, backfill it with spending time talking and listening to God so that you are more in tune for what he might have you say or what he might have you do. And I pray that we get to the point that even after we hear clearly from the Lord, we fast and we pray and we worship to ensure that we have heard from him clearly and that we're partnering with him on mission together. Here's one of the things I want to encourage us to do. Could you just bow your head and close your eyes for a moment?